and we're uh, and uh, the other thing is, if anybody wants my slides, just email me, and I'll perfectly happy to send you everything I got. The, they'll they will be on the the recording, so you can watch them there. But um, I'm certainly happy to to share any of these. Okay. All right, can everybody see that? Okay. Yes, I can see it. Excellent. All right, so what I'm going to talk about today is is using PK data for better in vitro and in vivo drug drug dosing and study design. Um, I kind of talked a little bit about the in vivo last week, or I'm sorry, last month when I was talking about interspecies scaling, because a lot of this has to do with going, you know, from from data you have in humans to, to mice or, or back and forth. So a lot of that I talked about, I'll touch on some of it again, but the, the main focus of, of these last two lectures is really how you take PK data, which relates dose to drug exposure to optimize studies in, in model systems. So your exposure response data is most translatable. Dan, Dan sorry, we're seeing your, um... Not the slide view, but the presenter view. Oh, okay. Let me. Uh, you might want to switch your monitors. Yeah. Let me see what this does. So. And then. Perfect. That's still the same. No, it's perfect now. Okay. Um, and so what I mean, what what we're really talking about is is how we utilize that PK data to get to an exposure that allows us to do the proper kind of uh, uh, PD assessment with response, which is what you're going to be doing when you're doing either cell culture studies or you're doing studies in in animals with um, with xenografts. So. How do you optimize that first part to make that as most relevant as possible to what you're what you're what you're you're going to see when you get to your species of interest that you're treating? And in, in tissue culture, we can we can control the drug concentration that we use. Right. And time, which is going to be the PK. Um, and then your PD is some measured endpoint, which would be IC50 or, or inhibition of target or, or some other thing that you're that you're trying to do. And so what my my point for this is that in in when we're looking at at pharmacokinetic studies we're really looking at the relationship between dose and exposure um and you know trying to to figure out genetics body size environment physiology anything like that 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 plays into that variability whereas in tissue culture studies we're really isolating the system at the level of drug there and measuring response and you can do you know, uh, genetic or environmental or physiology, physiologic variability, if you have, you know, the, the proper animal model, or if you're looking at, you know, the genetics of, of various cell lines and looking at, at drug response. So all those things can be tested, but the, the key is, is what concentration are you using and how long are you treating them? And is that reflective of the type of xenobiotic exposures you're, you're going to see once you start if in, in patients, in, in the patient population that you're treating, how is that reflective? Um, and, and I think, you know, it always gets down to thinking about um, PK parameters. And, and this is a, a slide that talks about PK-PD relationships and antimicrobial drugs. And um, if the first lecture I gave in this, in this series, I, I, you know, kind of reflected on, can we use, you know, antimicrobial drug, what we know, because we've done a lot of PK PD with, with antimicrobials over the years. Um, can we take anything that we've gleaned from those studies into, into cancer pharmacology? And um, I would suggest yes, although, you know, those studies are still in their infancy, although we do know some things, and I'll kind of show on the next slide, we don't do know that, you know, CMAX does matter for toxicity for, for some agents. We know that area under the curve or total exposure matters for response for some agents in terms of, of neutropenia and anti-tumor response. 
And we do know that sometimes you want to keep the drug over a specific um, threshold value to inhibit target as, as much as you can. Now, clearly with antimicrobial dosing, this is a lot easier to do because it's a lot easier to measure endpoints, which is, you know, growth inhibition of bacteria, stuff like that. Whereas in, in, you know, in cancer, this becomes much more difficult because a lot of times, you know, your drug therapy may be in the adjuvant setting. So you're looking at progression or you're looking at, you know, a disease-free interval, you know, you, in the animal model, you might be just looking at tumor shrinkage. But what I would argue is that it's important to kind of figure out what we need to optimize pharmacologically, because that's going to tell you how you may optimize the dosing when you get to the clinic. Do I need to give this drug at higher doses less frequently or lower doses more frequently? And, you know, there, there's been a, a, a lot of this um, done even with cytotoxics with the taxanes where people have given it every three weeks at one dose or every every week at, at, at about a third the dose or half the dose. And then even, you know, these continuous 96 hour infusions. And when you, when you look at it, there are, you know, subtle changes in, in response in terms of, of the toxicity to response ratio. And a lot of times the treatment just defaults to, to ease of giving the drug. So, um, you know, there are some differences that have been teased out for some of these drugs, but um, you know, how the pharmacokinetics affects the pharmacodynamics, how much and how often, Sometimes we need to determine, um, but oftentimes it's dictated by, by the dosing scenario that we're going to use. Okay, so <clears throat> time versus concentration. Does time and or concentration make a difference? And the answer is, is yes. And so here's an example with Dr. Rubison, and this is some data actually that um, I actually did this experiment last summer during the middle of, of COVID. It was for something else, but I was just using this this data, if, if you look at, at the response of, and in this case, these are um, osteosarcoma uh, cells. If you look at the response, just at a fixed time point at 120 hours, you get a nice go dose response where the more you treat, the more cells, <clears throat> the less proliferation you get. And when you look at the number of dead cells, you can see that it goes up. So this is good. A cytotoxic um, kills more cells and you add more concentration. But if you just look at the exact same at a single concentration, look at it over time, you can see that you get a nice decrease in um, survival as well at a single concentration. If you treated them just at 24 hours or looked at 24 or 48 or 72, you can see that time is also a component. And so what this argues is that both time and concentration are important for this drug. And so what you would want to look at, which, which one of these takes into account both time and concentration, it would be area under the curve. So area under the curve for for doxorubicin is, is, you know, what you really want to look at in terms of the exposure that relates um, response to cell killing. And so that pharmacokinetic data that you can get out of exposure um, data in, in humans or, or uh, the appropriate animal would be the metric that you want to then use to, to match to, to look at treatment. Um, but that's not always the case. And, and here's some, some data looking at a, at a MEK inhibitor in um, I think these are, I'm not sure what these are. I think these are colon uh, tumors. I'm not exactly sure, but there's some BRAF mutants, some that aren't. And the point here is that if you look here, um, these just kind of flatten out when you, when you get to higher concentrations. Why? Because these don't kill cells. They just block cells in G1. So you don't get this kind of increase in, in response over time. And at this point, it might be some threshold because once you get to five, you're not going to get any increase in response. And so for a drug like this, you know, do you really need to go higher um, than, than 10? <clears throat> the answer would be maybe not. And so uh, in this case, you would have a, you would have a threshold dose. And so um, you, you, you need to kind of think about, um, you know, how, how you would treat. And in this case, it might be time above a minimum inhibitory concentration might optimize your, your, your response. Now, this, this reminded me of something this, when I, when I was, you know, putting the slide together and saying, okay, now we have time above MIC. One of the problems with, with these gets down to how you do the experiment, right? Because these were all measured at a specific time when they looked at cell proliferation, whether it be 48, 96 hours or whatever. And I can guarantee you that all these cell lines did not have the same uh, growth rate. They had different doubling times. And that can be a problem because if you do this experiment and, and all I did here was just put a logarithmic growth equation with, with a cell line that had a doubling time of 18, um, or I think the other one was was 24 hours. I don't think it was 36 hours. I'm trying to remember what I 
what I did there, but um, this should be just 24 hours. And you can see if you look at cell line A versus cell line B, you get these very distinct growth kinetic differences based on how fast they divide when you talk about exponential growth. And if you give a drug that blocks, that doubles the doubling time for these cells, so it blocks proliferation like we we're shown here where you get this proliferative difference and in inhibition. So, and I'm just doing it at the 50% level here. So you get 50% inhibition doubling, your double time goes to two. If you look, it looks like, um, you know, you, you get these, these differences that look different, but in fact, they're both 50%. And if you plotted this as a fraction of control versus time, it would look like the cell that grew faster was more sensitive. Why? Because this is fraction of control, right? Which is what, what, how we do this, cell proliferation percent of control. And when your denominator is moving faster, it's going to look like they're more sensitive. And the reality is when I take those times and divide it by doubling time, these cells are right on these uh, responses are now right on top of each other. So the point here is that, that, that doubling time and growth rate also needs to be a variable to consider when you're doing these types of studies because of the fact that if it's going to grow slower, your denominator is moving slower. And what 50% inhibition looks like at, at three days in a cell that divides in 24 hours versus one that divides in 16 hours is going to be very different. Um, this is not uh, something that people have, have missed. Um, here's a paper that came out in, in Nature Methods um, in, in 2016. Um, and it, you know, what they, they show effectively the same curve that I showed here, just kind of showing that if you have slow, uh, medium or fast dividing cells, that you can get a difference. Um, the other thing they show here is that if you look at a series of breast cancer cell lines that are either HER2 amplified or triple negative or HR plus or kind of, you know, all of the above, if you look at response to, to various drugs, and here's ERB2 inhibitor potency, if you just measure the IC50, they're not significantly different across these cell lines. But if you take growth rate into account, these cells have a tendency to grow a little slower. Now, all of a sudden, you do have a significant response in the HER2 amplified population as opposed to these other breast cancer populations. So this really shows that you have, um, it is important to take the growth rate into effect. And this, this growth rate is just, you know, the, the kind of number of cells and, uh, and uh, at a various concentration um, per doubling. And so the, the math here is actually relatively simple when you just kind of look at the rates at various times and you can calculate this out based on growth rate. So the whole point here is that if you're gonna, if you're gonna do these studies, you need to think about the model systems that you're using as well as the concentrations and times that you're treating them. Okay. Time and concentration. In doing an in vitro cell cytotoxicity assay, and these are all things that most of us have done, a lot of cancer labs do them, you really only can control two things, how much and how long, okay? And so to address relevant questions about the drug, you need to know something about the dose exposure relationship in the species you're testing. So how will the tumor in vivo actually see the drug? All right, how will the tumor in vivo actually see the drug? And, you know, this, this is always an interesting question because uh, people have asked me, you know, should we measure drug in the tumor or in the plasma? Well, I would argue that the plasma is as good a surrogate as anything because that's going to be the road that takes the drug to the tumor. And it's really going to be reflective or at least similar enough to the concentration in the media that you're treating cells. So I do think that, that plasma levels are good. If a drug concentrates in the tumor as opposed to the plasma, it's going to concentrate in the cells as opposed to the media as well. And so you, you'll, you get that type of, of dynamic equilibrium either way. And so I do think it is important, um, you know, although you can talk about tumor uptake of drugs, and it's important to know because drugs that do accumulate in tumors are probably going to be better than drugs that don't, um, you know, the plasma levels are probably uh, the best ones to go on in terms of thinking about what concentration tumors are actually going to be seen. Okay, so let's look at an example. So here's some pharmacokinetic data with, with docetaxel, okay? And so when you, this is exposure following doses in humans at 30 or 36 mg per meter squared every seven days. The maximum concentration is about 1,000. The peak is very short lasting and it's below 10 nanomolars by six hours. Um, so how do I use this? without constantly changing drug levels to match this. So ideally, if you wanted to know about docetaxel and response in breast cancer, 
you know, if you wanted to mimic this completely, you'd go change the concentration every 10 minutes, wash and do that. Well, that's really not anything that's going to be all that doable. I mean, at, at some point you just can't, you, you cannot mimic the dynamic changes in drug that happen in um, uh, an animal that's, or a human that's pumping the drug around and peeing it out and metabolizing it and all that stuff. But what we can do is we know the, the exposure. Okay. So we know the area uh, under the curve right here, which is just the area under the curve here, the 48 hours. And we know it's about 1300 nanomolar times hours. Okay. If we use this, okay. If we say, okay, I know that docetaxel, you know, 1300 nanomolars times hours and these patients that are treated, you know, at 30 to 36 milligrams per meter squared, that means I could treat for a thousand nanomolar for 1.3 hours and my AUC in the tissue culture dish would be 1300. Or I could treat at 100 nanomolar for 13 hours, or I could treat at 10 nanomolar for 130 hours. Would the response be equivalent? I actually don't know that because that's an experiment. <laughs> that would be an interesting experiment. Is it all AUC driven? Okay. Do you need longer exposure? You know, for, you know, is the 100 nanomolar for 13 hours better? It'd be an interesting experiment to do. And, um, you know, I'm sure somewhere someone back did a, a, an experiment kind of like that. Um, and this actually, when I was putting this slide together, I was like, huh, I should probably do that experiment. So um, I'll probably probably do this experiment in the, in the not too distant future. But I think what this, what this does at least gets to the type of exposure you would see in a patient if you take into account that that area under the curve exposure. And so clearly it's going to be different because in vivo, you know, you have this higher concentration, then it comes down with respect to time until it's at a, you know, a level that's below the limit of quantitation, or it's at a level that you would say is not pharmacologically active. And, you know, in, in this case, if you treat for 48 hours and then wash your cells, or you treat for 96 hours, you know, you could do the math that way. All you have to do is multiply the concentration that you're treating at, which would be 0.1 times 48, and come up with your exposure to be 4.8 micromolar times hours. You know, How does that compare to this concentration? It's less than that. So I would say that you're, you're under um, exposing at that concentration. If you treated, now this is 0.1 micromolar, so that would be 100 here, right? Um, if you treated at, at 250, you know, um, you could count that out. That would be, or I guess this is 200. So it'd be, be 9.6. Okay. Um, and that would be, you know, now you're, you're getting up to this concentration. And if you concent if you did it at basically, um, 500, um, or five micromolar, which would be, oh, um, where would that be? 5,000 that'd be up here. Um, you can see that you would get, uh, you know, a, a curve that would give 24 micromolar times hours, which is, you know, just a little bit more than that. Um, and I guess that's 0.5 micromolar, so that would be around here. Um, and so the, the, the point here is that you can make comparisons between what you're exposing to your cells and culture with regards to what you can see in vivo um, using some pretty simple math, okay? And... Um, actually I've, I've done this, this calculation for, um, lots of drugs and this data, I'd be, I'd be more than happy to send anybody that, that wants it. Um, I did this for a, for a grant application and I have the, the references here. Um, and so, you know, for bleomycin at a dose of 15 megs per meter squared, which is pretty standard, um, the exposure that you get, if you look at their, the pharmacokinetics in people is about 2.82 micromolar times hours for bortezomib at, at this dose. And so all of these are kind of standard doses. And I've done docetaxel at both um, 30 and 36, as well as, as 100. Um, you should be uh, satisfied here that when you go up about threefold in dose, you get about threefold the exposure. That's, <laughs> that, that's really good. Um, when you look at, at, at doxorubicin, it's about 4.28, a topicide. But uh, my, my point here is that if you go in the literature, you can find this for, for a lot of drugs to decide if what I'm doing in culture could be assumed to be relevant 
to what you what you're actually going to see in patients all right am i way too high am i too low and and i'll go through some of these in a minute with with actual cell line data um, uh, put on top of it because it's pretty interesting when you do that now you can also um, you know there there are dynamic changes that happen in culture most of these drugs are very stable when you put them in culture and if you measure it over time it'll be about the same so they're not being metabolized by the tumor cell um, cisplatin is not and so actually when i did this this calculation for the the exposures um, i i did it um, it's not stable in media and breaks down with a half-life of 1.64 hours um, so you can do first order decay uh, in culture uh, for an AUC calculation of cisplatin, um, you know, and you can you can just do that by your cisplatin initial and divide by 0.423 per hour and you could calculate your AUC um, that way because it's not going to be this type of, of triangle or I'm sorry of, of a rectangle in culture it's going to go down. Um, at a first order rate, which would be linear on this on this log scale. And so you could actually you're going to get a triangle instead of a, a square. So you can actually utilize that information that you know about the stability and culture um, to to account for that if you have some of that data. So um, it doesn't always have to be a rectangle. It can also be, you know, if, if you have if you know some decay rate in culture, you can calculate that out. So again, um, I have this, uh, I've done this for all these drugs with these references. So if any of these are things you're interested in, you can, you can just email me and I, I'll gladly send you all this, this, this table with this information. Well, does that matter? Okay. Um, does this matter? Um, I, I would argue yes. And <coughs> let's look at some examples here. Here's cytarabine, which is generally dosed at hundred megas per meter squared times 10 days. So what I did is I took, you know, this and I'm, you, I mean, you multiply the 100 meters squared by the fact that you're getting it 10 days in a row. So you get quite a bit of it. Um, and if you look at the GI 50, which shows up to be right here when you look at it and you look at all, and this is the NCI 60 cell lines with all their GI 50s to cytarabine, um, about half of them are fall below that and half of them fall are above that. So this is the range where you see sensitivity to these drugs. Um, for cisplatin here in the green, you can see that you get um, a majority of them uh, that, are, that are sensitive um, to, to cisplatin. Um, doxorubicin, which is here in the black, you get about 50-50. For docetaxel, you see about 50-50. And for uh, bortezomib, um, you also get this kind of most of them are below it, most of them are sensitive. Interesting for bleomycin, um, most of them are above it. So this would argue that bleomycin at the concentrations you can get in patients uh, doesn't kill very many tumor cells. Well, this is a drug that's not used that broadly and it's not that effective. Um, and so it may be, um, you know, because of these, these dose limiting toxicities associated with bleo and its lung toxicity that you just can't get it high enough to kill tumor cells either. So. The point is, is that when you actually put these things on data and look at them, you go, wow, this really starts to break down um, maybe what we would call sensitive and resistant cell lines based on what you can actually get in, into exposure. So, um, you know, some drugs uh, show in vivo exposure that most cell lines are resistant. Some like bortezomib and cisplatin show that that most are, are sensitive. And I would argue that, you know, maybe this is a better metric to use for sensitivity. Um, you know, in terms of exposure than opposed to just the top half and the bottom half, you know. And so there, there may be, um, you know, ways to define sensitivity uh, outside of just the, okay, 50% of them are sensitive, 50% of them are resistant. And so you can kind of do that in a, in a little different way. Okay. Um, what about drugs that are dosed more frequently? Well, I, I kind of did that here with cytarabine because it's dosed every 10 days. But for a drug that's do dosed more frequently, and especially if we're getting into maybe a targeted agent, um, you may just want to take the average. So here's a drug that's dosed every hour, or I'm sorry, every eight hours. Here's one that's dosed every 24. And this is what you get, right? You get a, a, a kind of um, average and you get a, a steady state once they're at, at steady state level. So I would argue that for drugs that are dosed, maybe molecular targeted agents, now you need to maybe look at what their average level is, especially if they're dosed, you know, twice a day or three times a day, or even daily. Um, it, it may not be the AUC, although, um, you know, 
dosing right in the middle is going to get pretty close to what the AUC value is. You may just want to look at average steady state levels once they're dosed every day and use that. Okay. Now, why do I say that? Well, because that can get complicated because a lot of times the only thing you're going to have maybe in the pharmacokinetics is after the first dose, right? So somebody, you may go and get a, a phase one study that has a PK and it's, you know, for an oral drug and they've only measured it after the first dose, but the half-life is, you know, 36 hours. Well, if you're going to dose it every day or every 12 hours and it has a half-life that's relatively long, this drug's going to accumulate, which is shown here, right? It starts to go up and up and up and then reaches a steady state. Well, you can account for that too, okay? Um, so here's an example with, with vandiotinib. Um, and, and this is an extreme example because its half-life is, you know, 100 to 120 hours in people. Um, but the best thing was in the initial um, phase one study that was done with this drug for safety, they did pharmacokinetics on day one. You can see it goes up and it stays up because the half-life is incredibly long. When you looked at day 29, it was already at now 1,000 because it's accumulated. Um, and it just basically stays there the whole time. So... And my point about this is if you look at the single dose data and you just looked at this, you'd say, well, you know, based on these air bars and the peak here at four hours or eight hours, my treatment should be about 100 to 300 nanograms per mil. And that'll be relevant to what happens in people when they're dosed. OK, well, that's not exactly right, because after, you know, a number of days, they're going to be up here. Um, and so the steady state data is going to tell you that this is about 10 times higher. Um, and so, you know, there are ways to do a little bit of, of, of pharmacokinetic calculations. Um, there's something called an accumulation factor, which is one over one minus e to the negative k times tau. Um, the KEL is uh, dependent on the half-life and tau is the dosing interval. So all you need to know is the half-life and the dosing interval, and you can calculate out the accumulation factor. Um, in this case, in humans, it's about seven. Uh, if it's dosed uh, uh, every day um, using a half-life of 110 hours, it might be a little higher than that because the half-life has been reported to be as long as 200 hours in some patients, but, you know, it, it's going to be around 7 to 10 is that accumulation factor. And in mice, that's, that's 2 because their half-life is 24 hours. And so, um, and, uh, so if, if you dosed every day with a, with a half-life of 24 hours, your accumulation factor is 2. And so the, the point here is, is that if you were trying to reflect levels that you see in humans, you would use a factor of seven based on that, that initial PK. For a mouse, you would use uh, an accumulation factor of two. Now, you might be asking, why the heck do I care what the accumulation factor in mice is? And the point is, is that that, that relationship between the seven and the two in humans versus mice becomes important if you're going to in vivo studies. Now, for tissue culture and if you're treating human cell lines, you know, you want to use that seven and, and calculate out what, you know, you should use, which would be around, oh, I don't know, thousand to, to two, that one micromolar to, to two micromolar is what you're going to see in terms of plasma levels. But for in vivo extrapolation, um, what we did is, is, is took the original uh, human PK data for, for vandiotinib, and that's shown here. Um, using doses from everywhere from, what is this, 50 to 100 to 200 to 300 to 500 to 600 uh, milligrams per day. When you look at the Cmax or the area under the curve associated with that, you get this black straight line if you, if you regress it. And if you look at, now oh, it's important to point out, these Cmaxes and AUCs are based on um, the, the data with the accumulation factor taken into account. So they're multiplied by seven. So what you'd see at steady state. Why? Because we didn't have this data for every dose. I only had it for single doses. So we had to go back and extrapolate this to what we thought we would see at steady state. Then what you can do is you can take the, the, the PK from the mouse, but now you're not going to multiply it by seven. You're going to multiply it by two because that's the accumulation factor uh, in the mouse. And this is what, where these sit, if you give a miles, 10 milligrams per kg, 25 milligrams per kg, or 50 milligrams per kg. And this is based on, on real data. So what this would say is that if you give a mouse 50 mg per kg, 
their C max is 2000, the accumulation factor is two, so we would say it would be 4000 at steady state. Same thing with the area under the curve here as we calculated it, it would be about 50,000. We multiply it by two for accumulation, it becomes 100,000. Now we can estimate the pharmacokinetics that we would see in a mouse relative to what's seen in a human. Well, this drug, uh, vandiotinib, it's now called Caprelsa, and it's used for, you know, ret positive thyroid tumors. It was originally being developed by AstraZeneca as a kind of super eressa that hits um, uh, VEGFR and EGFR. That's why it's called V and etinib. Um, they got really clever with the naming. Uh, it didn't work out as a VEGF, uh, EGFR inhibitor, but it also hits ret um, actually quite sensitively. And so it's used in, in ret mutant thyroid tumors where it's pretty, pretty dang effective. The dose of this stuff is 300 milligrams per day. And so if you wanted to mimic what the, the CMAX in a human would be, you'd dose a mouse between 10 and 25 mg per kg. So probably, you know, 18 mg per kg. If you wanted to mimic the AUC you saw in a human, it would be a little bit less than 10. And you could extrapolate this curve down and be about nine. So my point here is that you can use the data in the human to figure out how you would dose a mouse to see the same concentrations daily that a human would be seen to, to ref, if you want to do a xenograph study or if you want to do some type of orthotopic study or if you want to do any type of, of you know, tumor study in mice. And so there are ways to use that human data, use the pharmacokinetic parameters to put it within the area that you're going to see exposure, not only in tissue culture, but also in, in animals. And I think that you know, there, I, I shared a, a paper last week in, in clinical cancer research that was published by folks at Genentech about oh, six or seven years ago now that showed when they take human equivalent doses, this type of stuff, levels that you can actually get in a human of these drugs, that their, their prediction of, of response rate in clinical trials gets much, much better. So when you use concentrations, when you have the human data and then can figure out what you can get in a mouse, all of a sudden you can do much better preclinical studies about predicting what's going to happen in uh, uh, these drugs when they get to the clinic and how patients are going to respond. Okay, um, I kind of mentioned this before, um, but I kind of expanded this to the to the GDSC panel instead of the NCI60, which is much, much more relevant. Um, and, and what I have here is is kind of the, the log sensitivity and paclitaxel sensitivity, and this is just log micromolar. And resistant, the, the, the mean is negative 4.16, so 4.16, whatever that means in micromolar, so um, you know, X nanomolar um, is their, their sensitivity. Um, do you just take the mean and then say these ones are resistant, these ones are sensitive? I would argue that's probably not the best way to do it, and you need to get back to see, again, something like this it'll tell you how much of that drug you can get in in you know in a person and so 14.64 micromolar times hours would be what i would say for paclitaxel um, that's what we can get exposure at at you know the kind of the the doses that they use clinically for the the q3 week and so using this i would say is a lot better than just saying you know nope the top half are going to be um, resistant the bottom half are going to be sensitive so using metrics of exposure um, are going to be a lot more telling than than just using you know the fifty percent cutoff in in each one, um, in in terms of dividing what you would say is a sensitive versus a resistant uh, cell line. Um, and why do I why do I say that? Well, because I I think that you know in some of these examples like here, um, you know I I can get enough bortezomib in almost you know, all patients based on this dose that most of these cells are going to be sensitive, at least the IC fifties are below that. So, um, what, what that says is that, you know, there, there are some drugs where most cells are going to be sensitive. And if you draw it down here and, and this may be more telling, cause this may be an IC 90, which may be more telling about clinical response. We haven't done that data. We don't have that data all that clear yet either. So I won't even say what is GI 50 good or is GI 90. We don't know about that either, but you know, whatever metric or response you're using, I think that, you know, you, you need to base it in the PK and what kind of exposure you can get as opposed to just some arbitrary cutoff of the top half or the bottom half. Okay, so, and this gets down to, to that question about, about clinically relevant doses, and I use this example because um, we, we, in this case, actually took into account metabolites. And this comes, 
you know, we treat a lot of times you'll be reading a paper or, you know, you'll treat with a, a novel agent and the IC50 is at the micromolar level and everybody goes up. It can't be a drug because, it, you know, it's at the micromolar level and we can never get that into patients. Well, that's that's actually hooey because um, there's a lot of drugs that we can get in at those levels if they're safe. And here's an example with with hydroxychloroquine. Um, which you know people have been looking at for a long time in terms of blocking autophagy and and in autophagy dependent cells, and here's a breakdown of the sensitivity of of canine and human osteosarcoma cells. This is some data that comes from my lab, as well as some some human breast cancer cell lines that that we threw in there. And if you treat you know a human with 1,200 milligrams of hydroxychloroquine, which is the the kind of MTD that they've seen in in cancer studies, um, 600 milligrams twice a day. Um, and this drug has like a 200 hour half-life as well. So you get pretty big accumulation. The plasma levels, the whole blood levels are like eight micromolar. And so when you look at that, you can see that there are, you know, cells that fall below that. But on top of that, its primary metabolite is desethyl hydroxychloroquine. And so you get this deethylation on, on one of the side chains. Um, and this drug actually has a half-life that's even longer. It's pharmacologically active, just like hydroxychloroquine and, and hangs out even longer. And so when you add the metabolite in there, that's also going to be active and be doing the same things to the lysosome that hydroxychloroquine does, all of a sudden those levels get up to be about a little above 12. And now all of a sudden a whole bunch of those cells fall into what you would say would be, you know, the, the DM values are, are now, you know, below exposures that we can get. And so in this case, I think you do need to take into account, you know, the, the metabolite. And so this number one shows that, that we can get a response in the micromolar, well, we can get a, a response in the micromolar level and that we can get drug levels that high, okay? And that we can get drug levels that high. So it's not pharmacologically irrelevant. And a lot of times if you throw out an inhibitor and say, oh, we're using a micromolar, everybody goes poo poo, you can never get that high. Well, well, we can, okay? We can for this drug. And so, you know, it may have some response. Its response may be more relevant to inhibiting autophagy and enhancing response of other drugs, but we can get some, some cellular response at the concentrations that you can see in patients when you treat with these drugs, okay? And this is just an illustration about, about the, the deseth deseth hydroxychloroquine, which is shown here. It's just removal of the R1 ethyl group and replacing it with a, with a hydrogen. And the pharmaca fours over here, right? Because this nitrogen, this nitrogen, and this nitrogen are what make the difference with hydroxychloroquine and why it accumulates in acidic vesicles. So, you know, getting rid of this desethyl group here does squatto to it. Um, the, and if you look, here's hydroxychloroquine, but look at desethyl hydroxychloroquine in the plasma of mice. I mean, it gets high. It's a thousand. It's up here and it stays there. And you see it in, in it accumulates in liver. I mean, because you if you look at HCQ, you metabolize it to desethyl, and then the desethyl just stays around, and this bis desethyl isn't formed very quickly. So, you know, this, this compound stays around for a long time in tissues as well as um, in the in the plasma of mice. So, considering both of these is important, especially when you look at how high these levels can be. Now, they don't get this high in humans, but they certainly get this high in mice. This gets back to the the same thing when we were when you're thinking about you know, what levels in mice should we use to reflect what we're doing in other species? Now, all of a sudden, we need to start thinking about the metabolites as well as the parent drug when comparing to the humans and the fact that the mouse might make more of this metabolite, which is then cleared slowly. So the dynamics and the predictions can get a little bit complicated when you start talking about these um, kind of um, uh, drug metabolite and active metabolite things. But I certainly think it's something to consider when you're, when you're trying to optimize the clinical relevance of your, of your, your model that you're using, whether it be in tissue culture, whether it be in, in some type of animal model. Okay, now I'm going to end by kind of talking about, about creating resistant cells, because the other thing that a lot of us do is we make, we try to make cells resistant to the therapies that we're working with to try to figure out, you know, longitudinally during therapy, what are, what are we going to be tackling when, when patients become resistant and their tumors become resistant to this, because invariably that's what's going to happen. And we've had a lot of success with, with, you know, BCR able inhibitors and, you know, looking at imatinib resistant clones and then having other drugs that we can, we can go to. And so this is something that's, that's proven out um, as being something that can be really useful with regards to kind of longitudinal treatment of cancer, especially with targeted agents. And so this paper came out, um, I think, you know, uh, actually in 2014 in Frontiers in Oncology. 
looking at in vitro development of, of chemotherapy and targeted drug resistant cell lines and, and just kind of talking about case studies and, and, and how to do this. And, you know, they, they talk about cisplatin, you know, continuous, and they say, well, this came from a high level lab, but they don't call it clinically relevant, right? Because I told you, you know, cisplatin isn't going to be continuously, you know, exposed, especially if it's breaking down and then you're, you continuously put more in there. Um, you know, Donna Rubison, pulse, pulsatory, because it's dosed every three weeks. Yeah, that would be clinically relevant. Paclitaxel pulse. So the point here is making these resistant cell lines. Should we pulse them or should we, you know, just put it in there and see what grows up? Well, if you want to know what the tumor is going to be seen, it's going to be getting hit and then released, hit and then released, hit and then released. And so these pulsatory doses are probably going to develop cells that may have phenotypic differences than ones that don't, okay, or ones that you develop you know, with, with a, a chronic exposure. And so, um, you know, I, I looked and they have this example with, um, with temozolomid, which is used to treat melanoma and some brain tumors. Um, and they, you know, they said what they did is they used temozolomid at 300 micromolars uh, as a six hour pulse every day for five days. And I was like, oh, okay. And they, they made some resistant cell lines and then they show that they're resistant now to, to temozolomid and you get, you know, they're, they don't, they're not, dead, the IC50s are longer. Um, so they have cells that can now, you know, are grow better in the presence of, of this drug, they have resistant cell lines, that then you can study and figure out how they do that and see if they can, you can block that and resensitize them, or whatever things we do with these resistant cell lines. And so I looked at this and I said, Okay, um, is this is this right? Well, if you just go and you Google temozolomid treatment and melanoma, you'll see that 150 milligrams per meter squared daily for five days every four weeks is, is a, a common uh, protocol use. So this pulsing for five days is dead on for what you would see in, in you know, what a patient would see. They would see it, you know, bam, um, treated for um, uh, uh, a pulse for every five days. And if you look six hours, oh, that's reasonable. You know, you still got exposure at six hours. So this all looks, looks pretty good. Um, and here's the plasma concentration profile for days um, um, one and five after oral administration. So I was thinking about, um, you know, this 300 micromolar and I said, okay, let's look at this. This is micrograms per mil. It gets about 10. Well, the molecular weight of temozolomid is 194.2. Um, and so, you know, one microgram per mil is equivalent to 5.1 micromolar. Um, they get about to 10, which would be 50 micromolar. And so I would say, I love the timing here, the six hour pulse each day for five days, but the concentration they're using may be a little bit too high relative to what any patient's ever going to see. Um, and so maybe, you know, a concentration of 50 or even hundred micromolar would be a lot more clinically relevant. Okay. And so, Again, you can use the PK data that you can find in humans, you know, because we ask this all the time, is this relevant, you know, and the answer is, well, let's look, okay, let's look. And so the data is out there to say, you know, would we ever see concentrations that high and how do we use that in our, in our preclinical and our, our preclinical models in vitro and our preclinical models in vivo um, to better reflect what you actually see in patients. And I would argue that's, you know, that's an answer and something, because people ask you all the time, where'd you come up with this concentration? You know, and the answer is, uh, that was the limit of solubility. Well, you know, that's not a, it's better to know what you can actually get in, in humans or the species of interest that you're treating. And then using that data, doing a few calculations and reflecting back on the model system that you're using. And that's, all that I've really been been talking about for the for the last kind of 50 minutes. So to summarize, I would argue that in vitro studies that take in vivo dosing and exposure into account are, you know, at least an attempt at mimicking the clinical condition. Is the data more relevant? I don't know. You know, I mean, you have to do that experiment, but my guess is yes. Um, and there is data to suggest in animal models, certainly from, from Genentech's work, that the more relevant they are to what they call human equivalent exposure, the more predictive their preclinical mouse studies are to the response rates they're going to get in the clinic. And so, um, and, you know, Van Diatineb is another good example where, you know, the doses we had to give mice to get responses in lung tumors back, you know, in the early aughts when we were doing those studies were 50 to 100 uh, mix per keg. We could never get that much, you know, in, in a human. 
it failed in that setting where it did work is in, you know, thyroid tumors and, and we could get responses at, you know, 10 megs per kg, which is relevant to what you saw in the people um, at those doses. And there's been some, some nice modeling of that done by, done by Erica Bradshaw to, to look at that. Um, so, you know, I think the data, I think there's enough data to say it is more relevant when you get back to reflective of, of what tumors are going to see uh, in patients. You know, the model system, you know, still may be tumor cells grown on plastic and bovine serum, but at least the amount of drug that you're using to treat them is better. And so, I mean, you can always, people can always pick holes and go, well, it doesn't do this, it doesn't do that either. I'm like, all right, at least I'm trying to do one thing that's, that's close to the clinical condition. Um, Talking about metabolic consequences and whether metabolites are active or not can alter exposure to drug equivalents. And I think if you know that, you can take that into account and do some cool stuff. You can also use meta metabolizing systems maybe for pro drugs. And we've done some of that with cyclophosphamide in the past. So, you know, there are ways to, to alter your system to do proper metabolism or at least some metabolism. And you can use PK data to convert dose to exposure, which is concentration and time. And so it's not just treating at X micromolar, it's how long are you going to treat them? And then you're getting into exposure, which is the same as AUC, because what you can control in culture is how much drug and how long you treat. Okay. So I think that, you know, using those, do you just leave it on for six days? You know, if you're dosing daily, maybe, but you know, if it's a drug that's gone in, in 48 hours and probably not, um, and, you know, matching exposures and rodent models can be accomplished if PKA data is available in both species. Um, you know, if anybody has questions about that, they want to make these more relevant, I am more than happy if you want to talk to me about this at looking at data and, and helping you calculate that stuff. Because I think, you know, this can make our studies better and this can do a lot of stuff. So the bottom line is, you know, I think if you can justify the dose with PK data, justify what you're doing, that I'm in the ballpark with PK data, you're going to do better science when you get close to what's going to occur in patients in there. Therefore, it's something I think we should consider in study design and when you're, and when you're doing your studies. Okay. All right. Hopefully everybody's finding these things useful. Um, you know, I think it's good things to discuss. That's what I'm trying to do is, is kind of, you know, reflect on on how we use the information out there to do to do better better studies, um, you know we don't get a lot of pharmacokinetics and pharmacology and any of our coursework um, anymore. It's more molecular pharmacology and stuff like that. So just trying to uh, remind people, um, I have to have to thank uh, Dr. Dr. Cota Gomez for all her help in in um, getting this out to Certec and getting everybody you know online and and running these. Um, and you know I just I kind of want to do them every month. Um, I'd like to get other people involved and anybody that has anything they want to talk about and we can have, you know, kind of good conversations uh, about this and, and start the start it going. Um, I don't have anything scheduled in November unless somebody else wants to do it because I have to, to teach. I have a bunch of teaching right in the middle. I'm teaching antimicrobials at that time to vet students. So I have a, a lot of stuff going. So the next one um, on my schedule will be December 9th. And I'd like people to send me some ideas on what you want to talk about and you know, how the form, we could make this more question and answer. It doesn't have to just be me lecturing. There's a lot of ways we can do this. We can review a paper that people want to do or some work data. There's lots of things we can do that I would love to be involved with. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and answer any questions that anybody has. Hey, Dan, this is Jean. I put a question in the chat, but yeah. all the stuff that you spoke about was the serum level in comparison. But for those of us that are neuro-oncologists that cannot necessarily use that, what would your recommendations be? Yeah, we got to look at it in the brain, right? I mean, or, or CNS. I mean, you, yeah, you're, you're, the one, you're the one case where that blood-brain barrier can be um, more of a problem than you'd probably find in tumors in other places. Um, and so, yeah, I think for CNS tumors, we have to be a little more discrete in what we talk about in terms of, of concentration of these drugs. Um, so, and in those cases, we probably do need to look at, at, um, you know, uh, uh CFS levels or, or, uh, in the tumor. So I absolutely correct on that. So, although, right, you get into all these arguments about, well, the blood brain barrier is not completely intact in the tumor. So blah, blah, blah. But I mean, it's still a barrier and something we got to think about. Any other, any other question?
Yeah, I mean, this is this is the kind of stuff, you know, this is what my lab does, thinking about treating cells and doing this stuff in mice and, and you know, advanced models. So, you know, I think for mouse studies and for any cell studies, if anybody has any any questions, you know, that's what, you know, we we do at, at core services. We talk to people and through the DT program, you know, trying to help do the best science we can. So feel free to reach out to me if you have any other questions or anything. All right. Thanks, everybody. Hey, Dan. Yeah. So, real quick, um, the did you see the email from Santiago that they pulled the drug for the um, that uh, VPS inhibitor that we were working with? No, no, I hadn't. Okay, so Sprint Biosciences sold to um discarda is the dr drug company i think um but basically so they pulled their mta they canceled their mta and required all drug to be um returned and or destroyed so i'm waiting to hear if they want returned versus destroyed um and the new company said that they uh at this time we're not going to be pursuing CNS issues, but I know that you had a question about its use in something else. Uh -huh. And so I have a, um, I have a uh, contact who has, a, who knows the people in that company. So if you still had an interest, um, obviously me doing it's not going to be very helpful, but if you still had an interest in moving forward with something non CNS, um, I could try and help get you connected. Yeah, that would be great. Because yeah, we're interested in, in some stuff that we're doing in osteo, it, especially because when I look at sensitivity to HCQ or, or sensitivity to um, uh, CRISPR knockouts, mm -hmm. BPS 34 has a strong correlation. <laughs> really? With both of those. Yes. That's so, awesome. So, so our VPS 34 CRISPR knockout almost correlates dead on with HCQ sensitivity. Really? That's interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. And I was like, what? Um, yeah, no, I, I'm in the process of, so they just signed the, the MTA termination letter, I think yesterday or the day before or something the university did. Um, and like I said, I'm waiting to hear back about destroying the drug. I don't know if you have any or not. I do. Um, <laughs> hold on to it for just a sec. Yeah. Um, and then uh, they're going to see about what we could potentially publish with the limited data that we have which of course sucks because we were just getting to start the in vivo stuff. So it'll be sort of a crappy in vitro, whatever, but yeah. at least maybe using some of your data would be helpful for the paper. So I'll let you yeah. know as we move forward with that, but um, just needed to let you know that. Yeah. If you could ping me with any contact information, cause I'd like to, I'd like to at least ask them if we could screen these osteo cells. I mean, I can get another VPS 34 inhibitor, but you know, that this yeah. one seems seems good yeah so yeah i'm i'll email you um and together with uh martin mcmahon who is at utah okay at the Hutch, and he knows the people in the company okay um i just have to remember i just have to find the name of the company again it's in my email somewhere but shut up. Don't laugh at me. <laughs> no, no, I'm just laughing at the whole situation. I'm like, oh, I was like, so annoyed. I was oh, just I like, know. come on. Like I knew they were in the discussion of sales or something like that, but I didn't realize that that meant like once it sold that there was a complete shutdown of everything. Yeah. I don't know why. I don't, I don't know why you quashed the, the science, you know? I mean, I think, um, that just, Oh, would we like her to stop recording? Yeah, sure. Now we're just gossiping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just wasn't sure if you wanted this information in, you know, for no, people no. watch the video. Oh, yeah, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. We're yeah. just, okay. we're just kidding. Yep. It's not, All right. no big deal. Thanks. Yeah.